Hi, everyone. I want to start off by saying how much I appreciate all the love and support that came through comments after last week's episode. And for those of you that are subscribers, I want to thank you. Uh, we hit a milestone today. We broke 40,000, and that's really something to be proud of in, in uh, 10 months of doing this organically. And uh, thank you for your support, and I hope we continue to give you content that you love. Uh, trying to figure out what would be a good episode to do for this week. And one of Mike's personal favorite pieces that I have in my collection is um, a piece that I acquired in a wonderful way. I'd gone to Paris for almost three weeks, and I spent almost the entire time looking for things to bring back home, going to some of the auctions at Drouot. And believe it or not, in three weeks I came back with three pieces. So while I was gone, I received an email from a woman who told me her mother had been a fairly well-known costume designer and that she had, her mother had passed away and that she had a large collection of items that she wanted to sell. And I said, well, I get back from Paris on this date. Can I see you maybe two days after that? So here's the ultimate irony. I spend almost three weeks in Paris looking for great things. And I get back and I go to this home and I end up acquiring this masterpiece, which is L'Envain. It's a robe de steel dress. It's in almost every major fashion museum. Uh, was from 1925-26, uh, fall winter. And it is a beautiful tissue taffeta with lesage embroidery. Um, the unfortunate thing is there is no underpinning, but there is absolutely no question. It's not an attribution. Uh, it is, it is, it is, it is L'Envain. And when you look at the robe de steel, it was a very popular style in uh, the mid-1920s because women got tired of wearing the straight chemise dresses. So uh, robe de steel is a reflection of 17th and 18th century France. It's um, pretty much a straight or it could be tailored silhouette, but it has the poof. And um, many of the robe de steel dresses from that time period have an actual hoop crinoline um, on both legs to help the poof stand out even more. Uh, the underpinnings are wonderful to look at, and I'm sorry I can't share that with you because it's not on this gown. So the costume designer's daughter um, the costume designer was a woman named Patricia Norris. So if you Google her, you'll see she did everything from Victor Victoria to 12 Years a Slave. Uh, she's quite an accomplished costume designer, and um, she passed away five years ago. L'Envain is beloved because it's truly the oldest fashion house still surviving in France which is actually a remarkable thing to say in this day and age with so many businesses folding. Uh, they've got a new bump with their new creative director. Um, in uh, we, the other dresses that we pulled, this beautiful dress is probably late 1980s. Uh, it is on the website if you're interested. And it's a beautiful silk charmeuse, uh, moray, taffeta, or file um, on the skirt, and then this great cummerbund style. It's rhinestones and gold bullion embroidery on tulle. And we looked it up in late 1980s. Interestingly enough, I did not know this, Claude Montana was the designer for L'Envain. Uh, most people are familiar with Albert Ibis for, uh, as the designer for L'Envain, and um, a lot of people were in mourning when he left the house of L'Envain. This beautiful Grecian-style gown is one of his creations. Uh, I love the labels during his time period because he would put the season and the year, and this one is summer 2011. L'Envain started off in 1889 as a milliner, and she branched into clothing about four years later when she was able to find a location on a prestigious street. Her 
the birth of her daughter in uh, 1909 really launched her clothing because she became extremely popular for making children's clothing. And that evolved into making mother and daughter outfits. So in 1909, when she started to develop children's clothing, um, she was also accepted to the Chambre Syndicale, uh, the Couturier uh, Syndicate. And um, her logo, which to this day still exists, is her and her daughter, which I think is really sweet. So with her uh, acceptance into the couture syndicate, she um, included in a lot of her clothing a lot of the support industries that were a part of cout the cout uh, couturiers. And in this beautiful robe de steel, Um, these bugle beads and seed beads are all silver lined and the silver is tarnished and then rhinestones and I like the fact that it has a pattern of feathers so one of the things I love about this is typically black silk taffeta is notorious for shattering for breaking for basically disintegrating and this piece has no evidence of shattering, which thrills me. My hope is to find uh, a museum that wants it because it's a dress that really should be uh, seen by lots of people. Uh, another robe de steel dress that you may be familiar with is Paul Poiré Sorbet. And um, yeah, I mean, look it up online. There's some really beautiful examples of how designers of the 1920s infuse that 17th, 18th century silhouette into their designs. And she was quite a visionary um, because she expanded beyond, you know, millinery, children's clothing, mother, daughter. She got into furniture and, of course, perfume, which is kind of the cash cow for most design companies. Um, at one point, she had 23 ateliers and 800 employees, which is kind of mind boggling because you think of in that time period, women were not really um, known for being involved in business. It was still a quote-unquote man's world. And uh, in 1926, she uh, ventured into making men's clothing as well. Um, one of the things that I loved reading in doing the research for this was uh, in 1915, there was a huge exposition in San, San Francisco called the Panama Pacific International Exposition, the PPIE. And at that exposition, there was a pavilion with 13 French fashion houses, and she was one that was represented at the PPIE. Uh, that exhibition, that um, PPIE was created to help bring San Francisco out of, literally out of the rubbles after the earthquake in 1906. So in closing, I once again want to thank you all for your love and support. Um, the kind words that you put in your comments, um, I read them all, so thank you. Um, I also want to say that if you have a particular thing that you'd like close-ups of, if you're designers, uh, DM us on Instagram um, and we will try to get that to you in not maybe not so timely manner because we're still um, focusing on dealing with the af aftermath of the looting and also trying to reopen. It's three months that we've been closed. But we love all of you. We, we're so grateful that we found um, a way to connect with people in our tribe and um, stay positive and stay healthy and be safe. And we look forward to seeing you maybe next week. But in the meantime, if you like what you saw this time, please subscribe and also like this video because it really improves our, uh, the algorithms in recommending this to other people as well. So um, thank you. That's, that's it for now. Thank you.